Welcome back, my fellow assassins, to another episode of the Dark Assassins podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. So today we're going to be diving in more into how software is developed and kind of some more of the uh, procedures and things that go into developing software, kind of building upon what we talked about in the first episode. So the first thing that has to be decided, aside from that you're going to go out and build a piece of software, is what programming language you're going to write it in. Now, there's a lot of different programming languages out there. Some of them are more specialized, some are more broadly, have a more broad scope. Um, And then sometimes it just, sometimes what language you choose just comes down to personal preference. Um, Now, there's a couple reasons why you'd want to choose one language over another one. So, for instance, if you're just learning a new language, obviously that's a good excuse to use that language because you want to get more familiar with it, learn how it works, and that kind of thing. But in other cases, you want to use a language because it's either the only language for the job or just the best language for the job. Now, what do I mean by that? So if you've ever used the internet before, you've probably used a web browser and gone to websites. Now, websites are not necessarily exclusively, but largely written in either HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are their main components. Now you can do some back-end stuff with other languages, but the vast majority of what you see on websites is HTML, CSS, which is kind of like the styling to make it look fancy, and then JavaScript, which JavaScript is horrible, by the way. It's a terrible language. Don't use it, Um, but it is very... um, That's just my opinion. I mean, you can use it, but it's... uh, I, I personally don't like it, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, so in that case, you would, you know, if you want to do web development, you would be using those kinds of languages. In comparison, if you wanted to, you know, say, build an operating system or be really low level on a machine and be able to manipulate memory and, you know, keyboard drivers and all that kind of stuff, then you want to be using a language like C or C++ or even assembly if you want to really get into the weeds on it. Um, and then if you want to, you know, more generalized, can run anywhere kind of language that program, rather, then you might want to go for something like a Java or maybe a Python. Um, and the reason why you'd want to go with those over, say, a C or C++ is because depending on what operating system you're writing for, C and C++, you have to do things differently which is kind of weird coming from, you know, coming from outside a software development background. But you can't, most of the stuff is the same, but once you get into other things like graphics dry, graphics and networking especially, and like file management and all that kind of stuff, there are some slight differences between writing, say, for macOS or Linux than writing for Windows if you're using C or C++, which is something you have to take into account. Another thing you have to take into account is the compiler that you're using and, you know, making sure you're linking to the right libraries and all that kind of thing. And it can be a real pain, speaking from experience, it can be a real pain trying to write, you know, cross-platform apps in C and C++, specifically for that purposes, you're, you know, you're developing on one machine and everything's working great. And then you try to build it on a different machine. Like say I'm, you know, writing my code on my Mac and then I try to go build it on, on a Windows environment and it just completely bricks and doesn't work. Um, I've had that experience many times and it is very annoying. Um, but the thing with Java and Python, for example, Java specifically, it doesn't, it runs in its own what it's called a JVM. It's a JVM, which is the Java Virtual Machine. And basically what that is, is it's, it's essentially it's running in its own operating system, essentially, on top of your whatever operating system you're running. So say if you're running... So the reason why this is nice is if you're running Windows, for example, 
you're running your code in the same environment, the Java virtual machine, that you would be running if you were, say, running on a Mac or running on Linux. You'd be running in that same virtual environment, so all the code works exactly the same, and it, it performs exactly like you'd expect it. So you only have to, you don't have to worry about, do I, am I including the right, the right stuff for Windows, or am I including the right stuff for Mac OS and Linux? Am I using the right function here? It's all the same. So if you're looking for like the most portable code possible, Java might be one of your best options because of how how versatile and portable it is because of that Java virtual machine. And similarly, Python is another would be another good option because of how versatile it is and it can be it's at this point, Python's pretty much installed on virtually every computer. Um, so it's really easy to just, you know, write up a quick Python program and you're off to the races. And then, so another thing you have to take into account is what kind of programming style are you going for? Are you going for more of a script-based type thing? Like you just want th something quick and dirty that you can just, you know, write up real quick and it'll be good to go. Like say you're writing like a quick command line tool. For example, I wrote a command line tool that allows you to manage all of your SSH connections. So for those that aren't familiar with that, basically it's a command line tool that I can run from the command line that allows me to manage every connection I have with all the servers that I want to manage remotely. So rather than having to type out commands for each individual server and you know keep SSH keys and that whole shebang of config files and all that stuff, I can have this one tool that I wrote that allows me to manage all of it from one command, and I can just say, like, connect to, like, say I want to connect to my um, my VPN server, for example. I can just say, connect VPN, and it'll connect me. Or I want to connect to my my DNS server, my PyHole instance. I can just say, connect PyHole, and everything's done for me. If I want to add a new connection, I can just type it and add it. And that's something that you could just, you know, that would just be like a script that you'd want to do. Or say you want to have a script that'll automatically convert, you know, Word documents to PDFs or something like that. You, that would be something you just want to write a script for. Not, you don't necessarily need, you know, objects and create a bunch of classes and all this stuff, which, you know, that's object-oriented programming is its own separate episode for sure. Um, but just... The idea of like how you want your program and your code to be structured is something that you should take into account. So if you want to do a script, you don't necessarily want to be writing something in Java or C or C++ or something like that. You'd want to go for something like a Python or a Bash or a Batch file on Windows. And most of this is probably sounding very foreign to you because you might not be familiar with what programming languages are. Um, necessarily, but just this, just to get you into the sense of thinking of there's a lot of thought that has to go into developing software on how you want it to function and how, what programming language you're going to pick for it. So if you want to go for more of an object oriented style program, again, you could go with Python. Python would be a decent choice. Python's object oriented. It can run anywhere. Same with Java. It's object oriented. It can run anywhere. C, C++, specifically C++ is object-oriented, C is not, um, although you can kind of hack your way to do object-oriented programming if you really need to in C, but if you, you might as well just use C++ at that point. Um, so the idea of, I'll just cover it real quick just to kind of get people up to speed if you're unfamiliar. So if you remember back to the first episode, which if you haven't listened to the first episode, I highly encourage you to, once you finish listening to this one, go back and listen to that because we kind of dive deep into uh, this concept of classes and objects and that kind of thing. Um, but basically, object-oriented programming is this idea that rather than having a bunch of different you know, variables for everything, you encapsulate like things into a object, for example. So rather than having a bunch of individual things that make up a person, you can just create a person object or a person class that can represent an entire person in code. 
which is what we're talking about when we're talking about object-oriented programming. So if you wanted to um, make like a food recipe or something, you could have a recipe class and then it, you know, it could have a bunch, every, every type of variable that you could imagine that you would need to have a recipe. Or you wanted to, um, you know, make a class or encapsulate what an animal is. You could create an animal object or an animal class to encapsulate that. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about object-oriented programming. So if you want to do something like that, then you'd want to make sure that you're using a language that can that has those abilities and that functionality. Um, and then another big consideration that you want to look into and think about is what kind of speed and performance do you want? So if you want the fastest speed and the best performance, then you want to go with something lower level that gets compiled down to machine code. And what that means is program is co programming languages like C and C++, for example, when you write them and you compile them into a program that can run, that compiler is essentially translating your code into hu from human readable code or in the sense it's human readable to the software developer i mean to most pe <laughs> most people if you show them code they're like i don't i don't understand this is a foreign language which in some cases if you want to say that coding is a foreign language then to every like high school and college that says you need a foreign language if you're a programmer you should get it you should get a free pass because you've learned because you're learning so many different computer languages and they should count especially in this day and age when computers are everywhere and everyone's using computers but that i'm gonna get off my soapbox now but yeah so when you compile c plus plus and c programs into a functional program that can run what the compiler is doing is this it basically it's translating the C and C++ code into the machine code that your CPU understands. So there's no translation layer when you run your program for the, that the computer has to go through. So think of it like if you're having a conversation with someone um, face to face, is it quicker to speak the same language or is or is it quicker to have a translator in between and have to translate everything that you want to say? It's obviously a lot quicker if you're both speaking the same language, right? So that's basically what C and C++ are doing with the compiler. The compiler pre-translates everything so you're speaking the same language as the computer is. Where if you contrast that to, say, a Java which because Java is running in the Java virtual machine, it's tr the co when it compiles the code, it's translated into a different language than the what the machine knows. So when the program's running, it has to do additional translation in order for the computer to be able to execute that code, which makes it a little bit slower. As you can imagine, because if I'm talking in English and I'm trying to talk to someone in, say, French, I don't know any French, so I'd have to go through a translator, you know, to translate what I'm saying in English to French so the person that I'm speaking to can understand what I'm saying. It's a lot slower than if, you know, I was speaking natively in French. So if you're looking for speed and the maximum amount of performance, you'd want to pick a programming language that when you compile the code, it gets compiled directly to machine code like C and C++, for instance. And then kind of the worst case of something you really don't want to do if you're going for speed and performance is what's called an interpreted language. So that would be something like Python. Now, how Python works is rather than, you know, you, you translating all that code into either the machine code, like so the computer can understand it, or you're translating it into the Java, into the code for the Java virtual machine to understand it, you're not doing any of the translation up front. All the translation is done when you run the program. This means that the computer has to translate it, you know, as it's trying to read through the code itself. So if you picture rather than you saying something to a translator and the translator saying it to the person that's trying to understand, imagine you're saying it 
to the person that doesn't understand what you're saying they're having to write it down and then you know go back and translate it and translate it like as they're receiving and writing it which is obviously even slower than you saying it to a translator and the translator saying it to them so if you want speed you don't want an an interpreted language but interpreted la- interpreted languages are nice like python is nice because you know it's really quick easy um, it's very user friendly when it comes as far as programming languages go. It's very uh, friendly to new software developers that aren't really familiar with programming. It's a good first language to learn um, in that sense. So these are the things you want to keep in mind. So if you want speed, you want performance, you probably want to go with like a C or a C++. If you want web development or anything to do with web, you probably want... HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, something like that. If you want something that'll run anywhere without having to worry about it, probably go with something like a Java or a, or a Python. Now, there's obviously a lot more languages out there that you could use. Um, there's a lot more options than just those that I mentioned for those use cases. But, you know, that's just to kind of give you a, an idea of what goes into picking a language when you're trying to come up with a program that you want to write. You have to think about what the program is going to do. Is it going to be object oriented? Is it not? Does it need to be as fast as possible? Can it be a little bit slower to be more um, more available, better be able to better run on every system without you having to make sure you have this specific, you know, libraries and functions for that to run on every system and that kind of thing. So then once you picked your programming language, the rest is pretty much the same, um, if you think about it. So, essentially, if you, th- the best way that I can describe programming languages to people that don't really understand what programming language is, is it's just like any language that you speak natively, right? So, sure, the syntax of this and the sentence structure might be different. Like you know, say in in Spanish, sometimes. It's kind of counterintuitive how you would say a phrase if you directly translate it into English. Like, it sounds like you're saying it in the wrong order, basically, um, or vice versa. So, but, you know, the, this, the words are still the same, right? Like, you're still saying, you know, I ate food today is still, you know, I ate food today. Like, the concept of creating sentences and, you know, adding, forming words together and that thing is the same. It's just how you structure your sentences might be different. So if you take something like, you know, you go back to the C, C++, and Java, the syntax for that or like how the sentences are structured is very, very similar. But then you go into something like Python and the syntax is different or the, the sentences and how it's how it's talked is different, you could say. So, but the concept is still the same. You know, if you need to write a for loop, sure, this the structure of how you write the set for loop might be different. But the concept of how the for loop works is still the same. Just like if you wanted to create, you know, variables, you know, in C or C++ or Java, you have to declare what kind of variable it is. Whereas something like a Python, you can just create a variable. You don't have to say, you know, what it's going to be because it's interpreted, which is one of the nice things about an interpreted language is you don't have to, everything's, you know, determined at runtime. So... You don't necessarily have to say, okay, this is going to be a string. And then the cool kind of cool thing about Python, it's kind of going off on a tangent here, is you don't have to say, you know, this is a string up front. And then the other nice thing is that that same variable that you had a string, you could create, you know, into like an integer later, for example. Like it's it's very versatile in that way and it doesn't really care, Um, which is kind of nice about the interpreted language rather than, you know, something like, Java, for example, where once you declare that variable as a string, it's a string and you cannot change it. Um, so that's that's one kind of cool thing, kind of going back to the programming languages. But so sure that dif- depending on what programming language you're using, the sentence structure might be different, but the core, you know, ideas stay the same. So once you learn one programming language and once you understand how to write programs, you know how to program. It's just a matter of learning the syntax of the new language. Like once you have a vocabulary in a given language, like once you know English, 
it's not, and you want to try to say, you know, learn a different language like Spanish, it's not, you know, I need to relearn how to think and all this stuff. No, I already know how to think and I know how to say sentences. I just need the vocabulary and the ability to create sentences and learn the structure. And that's what we're talking about, you know, when you go between different programming languages. The concepts are, are, aren't are different. They're the same concepts between C and JavaScript and Java and all of them. It's the same concepts. It's just how you, you know, format the sentences that is what's different. So this kind of ties into the next kind of the next big thing with developing software is algorithms. Now, when you think algorithms, I don't want you to think about the big scary things that run the Internet and are used by the big tech companies to send you targeted advertisements and all this big, scary, spooky stuff. No, 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 no. What I want you to think of is think of a recipe. So when you're making a recipe, say you're making a cookie recipe, that's an algorithm. You're literally essentially doing programming in real life. Um, because really, if you think about it, an algorithm, while it has this con- connotation of this big, scary computer science programmy thing, really all an algorithm is is just a process or sequence of steps to solve a problem. So in the case of recipes, your sequence of steps is taking, making sure you have all your ingredients, adding them together, and then cooking or baking them, and your quote-unquote problem is food, right? So if your recipe is, you know, bake, going back to baking cookies, you know, you have your, sequ- your sequence of steps, which is, you know, making sure you have your flour, your butter, your sugar, you know, if you're making chocolate chip cookies, your chocolate chips, or your you know, your nuts or, you know, whatever you want to add in your cookie, whatever cookies you're making. And then, you know, you make sure you add all your ingredients, mix them all together, put them in the oven, and you have cookies. And that's a sequence of steps that solves a problem. In this case, makes cookies. So, and it's the same every single time. Every time you make that cookie recipe, you do the exact same thing. And it's that's exactly how an algorithm works. If you're trying to, you know, say sort an array um, in, you know, in ascending or descending order, for example. And if you remember back to the first episode, an array is just a, you know, a collection of like things in a list. So, you know, and if you want to sort that, you know, it's the, you can use the same algorithm over and over and over again, just like you can use the same cookie recipe over and over and over again, and you get the same exact result. And, you know, that's the exact point. That's the point of, you know, algorithms is to a step-by-step process that gives you the same result. And if you're a kind of a math geek or whatever, you know, you can think of it the same way as a math equation. Um, Like you want to find, you know, a side of a right angle triangle. What do you use? Use the Pythagorean theorem. You know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You know, it's a formula, you plug everything in, and then you follow the algorithm of how you solve the formula to get the result you want. So when you think algorithms, don't think, you know, the big, scary, spooky things that control your life and the internet and how all these big tech companies work. Think of, you know, the smaller things, you know, like cooking recipes and that kind of thing that you'll do in your day-to-day life. Another example of algorithms in your day-to-day life is if you've ever played a card game and you had to sort your cards. That's an algorithm. Uh, Sure, depending on what card game you're playing, you might sort your cards differently. But the idea of sorting your cards is an algorithm. And, I mean, in computer science, we call that the insertion sort algorithm. But, you know, the premise is the same. You have your cards and you want to put them in a certain order so you take one card out put it in a different spot find your next card take it out put it in its appropriate spot and you just keep repeating that process until you're fully sorted and that's an algorithm you know it's not this big well it might sound like a big scary thing in reality it's not i mean we use algorithms in our day-to-day lives all the time and we we don't even think about it so yeah i mean that's that's another one of the core building bo- blocks when you're building software is making sure you have these algorithms that you can use to reuse and reuse, um, which make your life a lot a lot simpler. So in reality, if you've ever cooked something in your life, 
if you if you're a cook or you have cooked, you're essentially a programmer just, you know, in real life and not writing software, but you, in a way you you still kind of are a programmer. And then this kind of uh this gets me into my next point about um everyone's heard of the phrase, you know, don't reinvent the wheel or work smarter not harder, right? But when it comes to software development, sometimes you do want to rewrite the wheel, which is kind of weird, or you want to work harder because working quote unquote smarter is actually worse, which is kind of almost sounds counterintuitive, but hear me out on this. So kind of going back to what I said in the beginning of when you want to choose your programming language. If you're learning a programming language for the first time, obviously you're going to want to quote unquote reinvent the wheel in order to, you know, get an understanding of how this programming language works. Like sure the the programming language might have a built-in function into the library into, you know, the the language to say, you know, sort something. Like Python has its own sorting algorithm built into the language. So if you have an array, you can just call dot sort and it'll sort it for you. But to really understand how sorting works, you would want to write your own sorting algorithm to really understand how, what goes into sorting and how it works. So in that case, you would want to reinvent the wheel. Just like, you know, sure, you can go to the store and buy, you know, pre-made cookie dough or, you know, even pre-made cookies. But that doesn't really let you know how that doesn't give you an understanding of how baking cookies works or how baking works, right? If you want to understand how baking works, you have to buy all the ingredients yourself and, you know, put everything together and bake it and kind of go through that whole process. It's the same thing with software development in reality. It's just rather than, you know, making food, you're making, you know, programs. So if you're first learning a language, obviously you want to reinvent the wheel because you want to get an understanding of how this stuff works rather than just, you know, mindlessly implementing everything. Because while that's cool, if someone asks you how this works, you'll be like, oh, yeah, this is uh, it uses a queue data structure and and then it uses a, and then it sorts itself and blah, blah, blah. It's like, OK, well, then someone asks you, OK, well, how does it work? What's a queue? And then you're like, uh, I don't know. Like, you want to know how this stuff works if you're going to, you know, write it. So, I mean, I would like to think everyone knows what a queue is because if you've ever been to the DMV, uh, <laughs> you know darn well what a queue is because you've sat in the queue for a long time. Um, but, yeah, you, you want to get an understanding of how this stuff works. And then another reason why you might want to reinvent the wheel is if... You're, if there's a li- say there's a library out there that has the functionality that you're looking for. Like say there's a library out there that can serialize data and we'll get into what serializing data is in a little bit here. But say you want to, you know, there's, there's a library out there that serializes data for you. Like in C++ there's what there's this thing called the boost library which has a bunch of different, you know, which has a bunch of different functions that aren't built directly into the C++ programming language, but are written for C++ so you can use them. But the thing with the boost library is it's massive. It is an absolute chungus. It is huge and beefy. And if you ever download it, don't even bother getting yourself a cup of coffee. Go get yourself some food. Go make some food, something, because it's going to take a while to unzip that bad boy. It is huge. Um, so if you don't want to have to, you know, use a massive library, then you might want to reinvent the wheel and write the function yourself. Um, now, obviously, if you're using other aspects of the library, then by all means, don't bother reinventing the wheel. But where we're talking about reinventing the wheel is if you're trying to use this one library for its one function, you have a lot of what we call dead code in that library that you're just not using. So it's kind of a waste of space and memory to incorporate this massive library with all this functionality and you just don't use it. So 
it makes your code a lot more lightweight and portable in that sense if you um, write it yourself. And speaking of portability, if you're trying to develop software and you're you know pulling in other libraries, you know that's great that you don't have to write the code yourself for it uh, necessarily. But then you're making other people that if you're trying to develop with or, you know, for, even for end users, you're forcing them to use this library, which they may or may not have, which is kind of another downside of using, you know, these big libraries, which in this in that sense, you would want to reinvent the wheel to make your code more portable, because if you write everything yourself, all the codes there are all packaged up in your code. You don't have to worry about making sure you have this library linked in or the other or you have the library downloaded, the code downloaded from that library in order for it to work. Um, so going back to the serialization example, what is serialization? And that kind of goes into another point in software development is how do you save your save your, you know, your objects and your um, the memory in your code or whatever so you can reuse it. So unless you're writing a script that is just has essentially one function, just run this, do this, that's it. If you're, say, writing a video game or um, writing an operating system or literally writing anything where you need to reference, you know, these same objects in memory over and over again, or say you're trying to share something with someone and send something over a network, you can't just you know how are you get how are you gonna do that right like if I want if I'm writing a video game um, how do I you know make sure that when the player turns off the game and is done playing for the day how do I make sure that when they boot back into the game all their say all their data is still there all their you know they're in the exact same spot they have the same money that they had they have the same items that they had you know etc. How do I make sure that all that's the same? Well, that's where something like serialization comes in. Now, if you're trying to, if you're just strictly talking about saving data, you can, there's basically two big ways that you can think about it. One is using a database, but that's kind of its own separate thing where you have to make sure you have a database set up and you have to make calls to the database and that kind of thing where serialization is essentially a way of saving objects or saving memory to, say, a file where you can then reconstruct that data later into the ex into basically the exact same thing it was before. So kind of in a way you're cloning it. If you want, You're not exactly cloning it, but you're kind of cloning it if you think about it. So say we go back to our the first episode where we talked about the person class, right? So we made a class and an object that created a person. It had a name, age, height, and weight. Um, so if you wanted to serialize that person object, you could serialize their data to a file. And then the next time you ran the program, you could read that data back in and reconstruct the person. So kind of cloning it in a sense. But when... The, the thing with serialization that you have to keep in mind and why it's kind of hard to do and why people make libraries for it that do it all for you is you can't just say, you know, write the memory, you know, memory dump to the file, which in some languages like Java for, or Python, you can't even do that anyway. Um, you can't write memory. But even if you could write the memory to a file like you can in C++, that's not going to do you any good. Because how serialization has to work is you have to go down to the lowest data types. So I can't just say, you know, save this person to a file. No, no, you can't do that. What you have to do is you have to say, okay, this person has a name, age, height, and weight. So what I need to do is I need to save their age, their name, their height, and their weight. Now, there's, a, there's different ways you can do that. But you have to save, basically, break down the object down to its individual data types. So you have to break the person down into their name, age, height, and weight. Whereas when we talked about our other example where we went on to, you know, the software developer and the teacher, 
where the software developer had a had an array of programming languages they knew and the teacher had an array of classes that they teach you couldn't even save the array just you know save this array to you know a file or whatever you'd have to go through each individual element in that array and save that before and then save all that to a file so then you could read it back in so which I guess you could say might be a downside of serialization. But the really nice thing about serialization in this sense is once you come up with a method on how to do it, it's, you know, it's an algorithm. You can just call it and it does everything for you. It's like magic, even though it's not. We debunked that in the first episode. Um, (laughs) But, you know, you write it to, you save it, and then you can read it back in, which is called... When you serialize it is what you're doing when you're saving it. And then when you're reconstructing it, that's what we call deserialization or undoing the serialization. So you take, you know, say you saved it as a string of text. So you said person equals, and then you said name. um, And then what I like to do is when I, I wrote my own kind of serialization function. So what I did was I put like the name of the class or the name of the object, and then kind of did a bracket or a curly bracket or some some way to delineate that everything in this is part of this object. And then had the name of basically the name of each variable and the equivalent of what it was equal to. So for the example for the person object, we'll go back to this example. So when I want to serialize the person, what I can do is I can say, okay, this is a person, curly bracket, name, equals we know whatever the name was and then you could do some kind of delineator to say um this is the next thing and this isn't part of that name equals so for instance say you want to use a comma to delineate or you want to use a tab character or something like that just to let you know when you're reading it back in that this isn't part of the name this is part this is the next next thing so you would have person, curly bracket, name equals whatever the person's name was. Say we're using commas, comma, age equals whatever their age was, say, you know, 25, uh, comma, you know, then height equals whatever their height was, comma, weight equals whatever their weight was, curly bracket. And then you have that all, say, in a string, save it to a file, or you could transmit it over the network or whatever. And then when you want to recreate that person, you can then deserialize it and basically do everything in reverse. And then when you're reading that data in, you see the first thing is person. So you're like, okay, I'm this is a person object that I need to recreate. So then you go through each of the different parts in it, separated so you know everything's separated by commas right so you can basically split it by the commas and say okay so this is the first chunk what's the first chunk the first chunk is the name okay so this person has a name of so and so cool then we go to the next chunk okay this is the person's age they were 25 cool and then we go to the next chunk okay this is the person's height this is how tall they were cool save that And then lastly, this is the person's weight. This is how much they weighed. And just like that, you recreated the person. You deserialized that object and saved it back into memory and recreated them. So that's another thing you have to keep in mind when you're developing software is once the program is done running, how are you saving your data? So unless you're, you know, writing a script or something where you don't really care or you're writing a program that you never need to worry about saving anything, this obviously isn't a big deal to you. But If you're writing basically anything else that requires you to have some kind of way of saving or reloading things and reloading things so that they can be run again, like say you're, you know, writing a game, for example, and you need to make sure that you have all the players save data, you need to make sure you have some way that you can save all of these objects to either a file or a database or whatever and then be able to read them back in to the game exactly as they were. So that's where something like serialization comes in, like we talked about. And those are some of the, the concepts you're, that you're going to need to know when you're you know trying to write software or 
In other words, the concepts that go into creating software in the first place. So a game developer is going to have to figure out what language they're going to write it in, what language they're going to write their game in. Do I need speed? Is speed the number one priority? Do I need something to be really, really fast? Am I going to be writing a script to do something? Or is object? Or do I want to write my co- my program in an object-oriented fashion? You know, figure out what programming language I need. Then I need to figure out, you know, what algorithms I'm going to use, how to write those algorithms. Am I going to use algorithms from a pre, pre-made library, or, or am I going to reinvent the wheel and write it myself? How am I going to save user data? Am I going to save it to a database or serialize it so I can then read the data back in just as it was? These are the kind of things that you need to think about when, or the things that go into developing software, aside from, you know, the breaking it down into the bits and pieces, like into the individual data types, like we talked about in the first episode. And I think that's probably where we're going to wrap it up for this episode. So if you enjoyed the episode, I please ask that you would uh, give a, leave a rating and a review and share it with either a friend or family member or just anyone you think would get value out of the show. And if you have any questions about this episode or you have ideas or topics that you want me to potentially cover in a future episode, shoot me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com. Um, there's a link in the show notes below where you can just click on the email address down there. It's down there as well. You can Click on that email and shoot me an email. So that's going to do it for me in this episode of the Dark Assassins podcast. Until next time, my fellow assassins, remember, bull nothing equals true. If action not equal to null, return true. I'll see you next time on the Dark Assassins podcast. 